Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour. This coming to you live right from the auditorium here in the Northside Baptist Church in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping today we can be a real inspiration to all of our people out in the radio listening audience as well as you here in the auditorium. And the singing, the music, and the message will be on tape number 263. And the message title for today will be Ruth, message number two. We're endeavoring to expound the book of Ruth to our radio listening audience and you here in the auditorium. And if you'll follow me during this series, I believe we'll learn together some things about this wonderful book, the book of Ruth. I want you to turn there, will you please? It's page 315 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. While you're turning there, I want to say if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you tune into this station where you're now listening and get the broadcast Monday through Saturday, each day at 12 o'clock noon. And then, of course, every Sunday from 11 until 12, alive right from the auditorium here of the Northside Baptist Church. We have a list of tape we can send you, about 250 listed. You can select what you want. There are Sunday morning singing and messages, and they are available. They're $3 each. If you want to write in and get a list or write in for any tape that you desire, you can do so. Today and next Sunday will be the last time I will mention our proposed Holy Land tour for this year. Now, this is a real tour of a lifetime. Eight days in Israel, two days in Geneva, Switzerland. There's some of you on the borderline trying to make up your mind. You need to get in touch with me within the next week because time is running out. This is one of the greatest tours we've set up thus far. Be traveling to Swiss Airlines, which are quite safe. Be going into Tel Aviv, Israel, and from there over to Geneva, Switzerland, from there back into New York, a 10-day tour. I'll gladly supply you with a brochure that will give you in detail where we'll be going and what we'll be seeing. Not everything, of course, but some of the things that's listed on the brochure. I couldn't get all on there, of course. And it's a wonderful, wonderful trip. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, Post Office Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is a zip code number. This is a faith ministry. I must depend upon you that can see the need and value of this home mission work and willing to help me get the gospel in the highways, byways, and hedges, telling people about Jesus, being a blessing to shut-ins and reaching people in hospitals and prisons and convalescent homes and whatnot. And so you pray with me and work with me and getting out the gospel. Now in the book of Ruth, I'll read just a few verses in order to conserve time because I'll be giving you other verses during the message. And the Bible says in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, with Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives, the women of Moab. The name of the one was Ophir, the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Marlon and Kilion died, also both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Now that's as far as I'm reading. Remember I told you on last Sunday that you'll find four beautiful chapters in this great love story in the Bible. And you'll find 85 verses in the four chapters. You will find 2,578 words. You'll find 16 questions, 30 commands, and two promises in the book of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth is book number eight in the Bible, the time of new beginning. Now, the Bible said it was a time when the judges rule, 
and there was no king in Israel at this time. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And the more they did what they thought they wanted to do, the less they wanted to do what they did. And it was a time when they needed help. And God placed this book of Ruth, of course, in here between the book of Judges and 1 Samuel, book number 8. Now, last Sunday, we gave you the meaning of the names of some eight of these people found here in the book of Ruth. We'll not take time to go and review that because we must move on. And we left off last Sunday, if you recall, talking about how they went down into Moab. And Moab is God's wash pot. The Bible tells us plainly in the Word of God that Moab is God's wash pot. Uh, so they went down into Moab from Bethlehem, Judah, God's promised land. Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons were dwelling there in Bethlehem, a beautiful little place not far from Jerusalem, one of the most beautiful little towns there in the Middle East or in Israel. I always look forward to going to Bethlehem. I've been there some 12 times or more. Looking forward to going back again in March. It's a beautiful place to see the shepherd's field, see the cave where Christ was born in these different places. And so it's a beautiful little town. And we find here that Elimelech and Naomi lived there, but there came a famine in the land. And God sent this famine because of the disobedience of Israel. And instead of waiting out and turning to God and praying much for God to lift the famine, then they decided they would leave Bethlehem, Judah, and go down into Moab. Now, Moab was a country that God had placed a curse upon. It was a Moabitish people, a descendants of Lot and the union of his two daughters. Uh, one of them, a group of Moabites and the other Amorites down there in that particular country. And so we see they went down into this cursed land. And they went to Moab. They did not go into Egypt. Now Egypt speaks of the world. It's not the world it's that caused trouble, that brought them heartaches. It was not a place of the world like the land of Egypt. They did not go into Babylon. Now Babylon speaks of apostasy and backsliding. Israel backslid on God. They, they were captured and carried into Babylon. And they couldn't sing a song because of their backslidden condition. And they hanged their harps on the willers. Now this was not Babylon where they went, a place of confusion. But they went down to Moab, and Moab speaks of many different things. You'll find one verse of scripture in your Bible that tells you what Moab speaks of. Let me give you that verse and listen closely. In Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 11, Moab have been at ease from his youth. And he has settled on his lees, and has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, neither has he gone into captivity. Therefore his taste remained in him, and his scent is not changed. So here in Jeremiah chapter 48 and verse 11, God describes Moab, or the people of Moab, or the land of Moab. Now let's break it down and see what God is saying here in this verse of Scripture, and we'll find out the kind of land and the kind of people that Elimelech and Naomi went to join in the land of Moab. Now remember, they were people that worshipped false gods. They worshipped Moloch and, and uh, Chemoth and, and uh, Baal Peor. And they worshipped these gods, and many times they would heat these statues of these gods. And their Chemoth especially, they would take their little babies and uh, heat those arms and hands almost red hot, those false gods and throw those little babies into the red hot iron hands of those gods. They sacrificed multitudes of the little babies there in the hands of those gods in those days. It was a cursed land. In this day in which we live when we're killing millions of unborn babies in America, something similar to what they did there. Now we're fast headed toward a curse upon our country and a curse upon this world because of the murder of the unborn. And that's what they did. They'd take little infants that after they were born and throw them into the arms of these heathen gods and the little thing would scream and burn to death. Now that was terrible. That was horrible. Now you say, preach Edwards, that was a real horrible thing to do. Yes, it's also a horrible thing to do to chop up and kill 
a little unborn baby and chop it to pieces and there bring about the abortion. That's a horrible thing. The doctors and the nurses and those responsible are going to fear and tremble when they face God Almighty in the judgment by this kind of murder. You need to realize that. And so God put a curse upon Moab and one reason because of that thing. Another reason is because he would not let the Israelites come through their land, not even pass through, not even if they paid them for coming through. God didn't like that. Another reason, they were descendants of Lot and the union of his two daughters there in the cave. And they were a bunch of heathen. And God said they're cursed people. Not only that, God said they could not go into the congregation of the Lord for ten generations. For ten long generations, they could not go into the congregation of the Lord. But we want to find out what is meant uh, by this place called Moab. Now, the place called Moab, of course, we mention it's God's wash pot because down in Moab, in the wash pot of God, we find that um, Naomi was washed up. We find that Ophah was washed out. We see that Ruth was washed in, according to the Bible, and we'll say more about that later. But, but take a look at that verse of Scripture in Jeremiah chapter 48 and verse 11. The Bible said, He is concerned at ease from his youth. Here you find a people unconcerned. That's nothing that stalls and hinders the work and progress of God Almighty than for a people to become unconcerned. We're not going to have revivals. We're not going to see things happen. We're not going to get much accomplished as long as people are unconcerned. They come to God's house unconcerned. They leave God's house unconcerned. They come back the next Lord's Day the same way. They don't much care what happens. They don't care whether the souls are saved or not. They don't care whether backsliders never get right with God or not. They don't care whether sinners go to hell or not. Unconcerned. That's a picture here of the people in the land of Moab. Not only that, he is unfaithfully settled on his lees. Now this is taken from the picture of a wine bottle with wine in it and the drugs in the wine bottle. The dregs rather are dropped down to the bottom and the wine settles on top of the dregs. God said that's a picture of people down there in the land of Moab. They are settled down upon the dregs. They're just not being used or being helpful. Number three, he is unengaged. He has not been emptied from vessel to vessel. He said Moab has not been emptied from vessel to vessel. And that speaks of religious uh, stagnation. In many of our churches today, we have religious stagnation. The average little child can tell you exactly what's going to happen and what time it's going to happen during the service. It shouldn't be like that. We should be at liberty to praise God. We should be at liberty to thank the Lord for His blessings, to have liberty in our services, and not have a cut and dried powder as to what we can do and what we cannot do. We find a lot of churches today that start at 11 o'clock sharp, end up at 12 o'clock dull, and then the dead rise and see if it can't beat the other churches to McDonald's. Now, beloved, we need to have the Spirit of God to come in and lead us and guide us. And if we need to be here another hour, remain another hour. If we want to start shouting, then start shouting. If we want to praise God, then praise God. If we want to have a prayer meeting in the middle of service, have a prayer meeting. If we want to give an altar call, then have an altar call. We shouldn't be so cut and dried. But down here in Moab, it speaks of religious stagnation. And you'd be surprised at the religious stagnation you find in many of our modern churches today. They just have a little program to go by and that's it. Many of them get their messages and orders from headquarters, denominational headquarters if you please. And there they carry on in that manner. Not only that, the Bible said he is unpunished, neither had, ne neither had he gone into captivity. Now Israel had been into captivity, but not the people in the land of Moab. The reason is they were not God's people. Now God is not going to whip the devil's crowd. God will take care of his own children. God will never chastise the devil's outfit to where the transgress is already hard. But God will child train and chasten his own children. So says the word of God. But these people went unpunished. had never gone from captivity to captivity. And then number five, he is unchanged. Therefore, his taste remains in him. And unchanged people, 
a heathen people, a people with the curse of God upon them. They had not been changed by the power of God. Now when a sinner gets saved, he is changed by the power of God. If there's not a change in his life, you mark it down, he doesn't know anything about God. There's bound to be a change in the life of an individual when they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they were unchanged. Then number six, he is undiscernible. His scent is not changed, it tells you here. That is, he doesn't know right from wrong. He doesn't know a good thing when he smells it. He can't smell. He's, he's not alive. He's dead. Now, a real good old-fashioned Bible-believing Baptist can almost smell an independent Baptist church before he gets to it. And he hastens his step to get in there and worship with God's people. They know these things, and they search for these things in order to worship God. And so here they were undiscernible. As sin had not changed, so says the Bible. Now you'll find all of that in Jeremiah chapter 40 and verse 11 that tells you about the Moabitish people. Now let's move on to another thought. We find here at Elimelech and Naomi, and their two sons dwelled in Bethlehem, Judah. Now the reason it's called Bethlehem, Judah is because there's two Bethlehems in Israel. The other Bethlehem is further north. And this is Bethlehem, Judah, down near uh, Jerusalem where Jesus was born and so they dwell in Bethlehem Judah a place of God's blessings and Bethlehem means the house of bread yet they became somewhat discouraged and left the place of the house of bread and went down into Moab and got in the worst condition I've known people do that since I've been in the ministry I've known people become disgruntled and and leave a good old fundamental independent missionary Baptist church where the word of God is believed and preached and where people believe the Bible and take off and join some outfit that supports all kind of worldliness and, and liberalism and stuff of that type. What they do, they leave Bethlehem, Judah and go to Moab just like Elimelech and Naomi did here. They went down into Moab in a far worse country. They should have realized if they were going to get in touch with God that they should remain there at the house of bread. Bethlehem means the house of bread. But they became discouraged. They became disgruntled. They mortgaged their property. They owned some land. And they took off down in the Moab with their two little boys. And then notice what happened. They wasn't down there very long until the chastening hand of God came upon them. Now, if you're a child of God, you listen to this Baptist preacher, you hear me and hear me well. If you are born again believer and you disobey God and you don't listen to God and you don't come back into fellowship with God, sooner or later, the chastened rod of God will fall upon your back. God plainly said that would happen. You'll find that many places in the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 12 in particular. And so we find the chastening hand of God, the child training, the whipping that God gave them. Now God whips his children. God chases his children. God child trains his children. God doesn't chasten that sinner. You need never expect the God to chasten the sinner. A lot of times a man will join the church and he'll go along well for a while. Just like Ophir did, you know, Ophir went part of the way back to, to Bethlehem, Judah. And then she turned and went back to her gods. Now, sometimes a church member can go a long, long way through reformation. They come down, they reform, they turn over a new leaf. They say, I'm going to do better. They join the church many times, they're baptized. And then they go a long way, maybe many weeks and many months and sometimes years in the direction of the house of bread, so to speak. And then they turn and go back to Moab. They go back like Ophir did into Moab to worship her gods. And a lot of church members do that. And then sometimes people say, well, I wonder why God doesn't chasten that person. And they keep on wondering, why doesn't God chastise that person? He joined the church. He went to church regularly. He held a position in the church. He prayed. He gave his tithes and went along well for a while backslid on God, start cursing and living like the devil, running with the devil's outfit and been going on for many years, and God hasn't chastened that person. You know why? They were not saved. 
They just, they just kind of reformed, went a long way. Now, a man can go a long way in religious activities. He can go a long way in church work without being saved. And they go a long way, and then they turn and go back to Moab, and they're not chastened because they're not God's children. Now, if they're God's children, sooner or later, God will put the chastened rod to their backs. They don't get away with it. God is long-suffering. God is patient. But sooner or later, God will crack down because God knows their number. God knows where they live. God knows the house number. God knows their phone number. God knows the route on which they live. God knows the number of hairs on their head. God knows how long they've been backslidden. You don't fool God. And God says, now they're not coming back. They're not going to do right. They're not going to repent and come back to me. I'm going to lay the rod to them. And God puts the rod to them. Now you say, preacher, what is the rod? I don't know. It could be sickness. It could be ill health. It could be the loss of a member of the family. It could be bankruptcy. It could be many things. It could be a handicap. It could be many things because God knows exactly what to touch and the kind of rod to use on each individual. He might not use the same rod on every individual. What might uh, break one down wouldn't break the other. And God knows what it takes in order to bring his children back in the fellowship. And so they go down into Moab. They wasn't there long until Elimelech died. Now there they were. Naomi had a wonderful husband. Fine husband. And so he carried the family down there. He should have been the head of the house. And he carried the family down there. The man is the head of the house. The woman is the heart of the house. We don't need two heads today. I feel sorry for any house that's got two heads. The woman has to be on equal basis with the man and, and say, well, um, I'm equal with my husband and everything and every family. No, no. No, you're not. The man is the head. The woman is the heart. And when you have uh, uh, two heads in the house, you have monstrosity. You need a head and you need a heart. No home is complete without a good wife. The good wife knows how to touch up the things at home and how to take care of the things at home. Well, I'll tell you, my house would look pitiful if I had to straighten up everything in the house, put the little do gadgets here and dust this one and make up the bed and do the cooking. Boy, it'd be a sight, I'll tell you it would. But when my wife walks in and she hangs around there a while, you think you're walking into a dollhouse sometimes. She has her things cleaned up and dusted and neat and in place, and she knows where to place every one of them. I can hardly go to the dresser to get a shirt. She said, wait a minute, I'll get it for you. Now, why does she want to do that? She knows I'll scratch around in there and get all them shirts misplaced and pull out one from under the bottom, leave the others on top of the dresser. She said, wait, I, I'll get your shirt. Just let me get that shirt for you because she don't want to have to go back and straighten them out again. Now, a man just can't hardly do that, you know, like a woman can. And so, man, Elimelech here was a pretty good old kind of a fella, and he had a wife, he needed his wife, and she needed him, but they backslid on God. They disobeyed God. They became disobedient. And in due time, things began to happen. I don't know how long they remained down there in Moab before God sent the death angel down to take them out of Elimelech out. I don't know. But the Bible says Elimelech died. Now Elimelech could have been buried in a Machpelah up there with Uncle Abraham in Hebron maybe. I've been buried somewhere around Jerusalem in the Valley of Jehoshaphat or someplace like that. But they buried the old man down in a cursed land, in a cursed country. Naomi goes out. She sees him place her husband in a grave with a curse upon that land. They dig a hole in the ground that's cursed ground. They put her husband in that hole and they cut him up. And there she puts maybe a little a gravestone in a cursed land. There this dear woman walks away from that grave far away from Bethlehem, Judah, way down in Moab and leaves her dear husband there in this uh, grave down there in the land of Moab. She went back home grieving about this matter. Now the Bible tells us then it wasn't long after that they had two sickly boys. Those boys no doubt were in ill health before they left Bethlehem Judah. One means a sickly one, the other means a pining one, a consumptuous one. And there they went down with them, of course, as little boys. It wasn't long until they uh, 
uh, married Moabitish women. They married women from that land, women that had a curse upon them, women that couldn't go in the congregation of God for ten generations, women that came from the incest of Lot and his daughters, women uh, that came from a, a nation that wouldn't let God's people pass through it when they were coming through going to the promised land. They had disobeyed. They married two women out of the land of Moab. Well, there they were, married these two women. Wait a minute. It was a great honor to have children and a great, great honor to have grandchildren. That was poor old Naomi. She said, now my husband's gone. A grandchild would help me. I hope my two boys will have children. I'd like for those grandchildren to come along. That'll help me get my mind off of my dear husband, laying out children on that cursed ground. Oh, if they could have children, but they didn't have any. God did not let those girls have children by those two boys that came down with their mother and dad. That was a curse upon those boys. A curse upon them because they disobeyed God and it was a chastening rod of God upon them because of disobedience. God wouldn't let them have children. That was a chastening hand of God. In those days, beloved, if they couldn't have children, it was a bad omen. It's a bad sign if you couldn't have children. And to have grandchildren, oh, that was wonderful. In this day, a lot of women think it's a curse to have a child. Oh, I don't want a child. Give me a cat. Give me a bird. Give me a dog. I don't want a young one. I don't want any children. It's a curse to have a child. That shows you how far we get away from the Bible and the things of God. Oh, listen, one of the sweetest little things ever placed in your arms is a little precious baby that's been placed in your arms by the hand of God. They're so sweet and so wonderful. And my wife grumbles now because we don't have any, any uh, great grand youngins. Oh, she said, when uh, we're going to have some great grand youngins, I said, hold on there, sis. I'm old enough now. I, I, I get them great grand youngins while people think I'm 99. Now, I don't want to think I'm 99 yet. Oh, she said, I want some great grand youngins. Well, one of these days, maybe God will give us some great grand youngins. But anyway, it's an honor. It's an honor to have children. It's an honor to have grandchildren. It's a great, great honor to have great, great grandchildren. And the longer you live, the better. Mother Jarrett sitting here, right here in front of me. God bless Mother Jarrett. She's a faithful member of this church, sitting right here looking at me right now. And she's got over a hundred Grand youngins and great grand youngins and great great grand youngins. God's blessed granny here. All them descendants. Oh, listen to me. It's a blessing when God gives you children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren. And they didn't have any. That was a chastening hand of God upon them. And then, of course, something else happened. God didn't stop there. Those boys were sickly. Oh, they were sick. They just about to rob the drugstore down there, I surmise. And they, they just, they're sickly boys. Man, they just couldn't feel good at all. Uh, they hurt at night and, and ate during the day. They just couldn't hardly make it. They're so sickly. That was a chastening hand of God upon that family. No, misunderstand me now. I'm not saying all of your sickness is because of God's chastening. I'm not saying that. But that was a chastening hand of God upon them. And then something else happened. One of those boys died. Poor old Naomi. There they take him and his wife and Ruth and Marlon dies and Ruth and Naomi, Ophir and Kilion. They take that boy out there and bury him by his daddy. Place him in a cursed land. Dig another hole in the cursed earth and put that boy down beside of his daddy. Poor old Naomi. She's had it. She's lost her husband and she lost one of her sons. She comes back home, and then lo and behold, it's not long until that other boy, being another sick boy, and he dies. Oh, her heart was broken, and she goes out, her and her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Ophir, they go out on the hillside in a cursed ground. They dig grave number three, and they put that boy down beside of his brother. And there Naomi stands there, and she looks at those tombstones in a cursed land, and when she went back to Bethlehem, Judah, you know what she said? She said, I went away full from here, but I've come back empty. 
God Almighty emptied her up down there in Moab. And God knows exactly how to empty you. God can empty your bank account. God can empty your family. God can empty your health. There's many things God can do if you're a disobedient child of God and don't obey the Lord when he speaks to your heart. And God laid the rod upon this family. And there they are, poor old Naomi, poor old Ruth, poor old Ophir, way down there in the land of Moab, down there with buried husbands and sons and the two daughters' husbands. No doubt every day just about it for a while, Naomi, Ruth, and Ophir would go to them graves. And they would stand there. And they'd look at those graves and they would weep. Oh, she thought about the time when she had a family back in Bethlehem, Judah. But they left the house of bread and went into a cursed land. Now the Lord went into tomorrow, next Sunday. We'll take up here and move on. This is tape number two, message number two on the book of Ruth. Tape number 263. They're available if you'd like to have them. Let us all stand to our feet. Dear Father in heaven, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. Oh God, as we look back and see what happened to this family of Elimelech, how they disobeyed God and went to Moab. There may be some of your children today living in Moab and you want them back in Bethlehem. God, you know how to get them back. It may cost them, but our Father let us know how to do it. And we pray that you speak to hearts, speak to sinners, speak to your people. In Christ's name, amen. While David plays a couple of numbers for us, a couple of stanzas, Tony's standing here to help. I'm here to help. If you're here without God, if you're here backslidden on God, if you want to come down and unite with the church where we receive members, if God speaks to you and you'll need to obey God, if God speaks to your heart, would you come while we wait? While we play a couple of stanzas, would you come? I'm not trying to high pressure you. I brought the message and God has spoken to you through the message and that's all that's needed. How about it?